world of contemporary art through a very securitous route. Uh, I didn't study art history initially, I studied journalism. And I think that that um, initial underpinning has really um, fueled my passion for what it is that I do. It is a way to help shape and tell the story of the world of art as we're living it today. Uh, I chose specifically to follow um, in the realm of the contemporary because it is a way in which you are writing history as you go along and, um, and you are covering bits and pieces of history. And you really can't tell the full spectrum of history until everyone's voices are somehow incorporated and engaged into that. And so part of the work that you'll see that I've been doing, which is a small synopsis of the last 10 years, uh, has very much um, worked in that vein to either pose questions, um, to um, present proposals and thesis um, to the general public about the field and certain practices, and uh, to introduce artists who have either been forgotten uh, within that realm or who have just not been recognized um, uh, within that. So part of working within the realm of contemporary art is that you are always, constantly, educating yourself in public. Um, I said other hazards because I thought it was an intriguing hook to get you here. Uh, <laughs> but uh, the truth is that the only hazard is sometimes a, well, maybe a, a tinge of um, angry engagement, let's say. Uh, but it's always an opportunity, always a platform to really discuss ideas um, that artists really grapple with, things that are reflective of where we are. And sometimes that's hard for people to, to engage in at the time. Um, but you use it as a platform. So the first exhibition um, that I mounted at the uh, museum, the Contemporary Arts Museum, uh, rather the large scale exhibition, was one called Splat Boom Pow. This is in 2003, and it was at a time where people were revisiting the concept of pop art and the uh, imprint that it had left in the field. And uh, I started thinking to myself, okay, that's wonderful, it's great to celebrate pop art, but what has happened in between this period of pop art and where a lot of contemporary artists are today, younger artists uh, looking at Japanese anime, it was the rise of the um, uh, uh, Yoshimura Naras of the world and uh, Takashi Murakamis of the world into the realm of contemporary art. So there was this huge chasm between what happened in the 60s and what was happening today. Uh, and also within that realm, you don't really see the diversity of voices within pop art. Uh, you don't see the Asian American or the African American or the um, Latin American voices that have been brought to bear. So I wanted to do this exhibition that really uh, functioned at many different levels. On one hand, it really celebrated the imprint of pop art. It also brought to the fore the diversity of the way people work in a very intergenerational and multicultural way. Um, so on one hand, it was lively, it was colorful, um, it was a, a way to um, uh, bring back to the minds of the younger people um, that there were things that, um, that, that the howdy duties of the world, uh, um, the Warhol myth series, uh, it was able to bring those things back to the fore, the Mel Ramos and his uh, early um, pop works, uh, celebrating the sort of icons of cartoons at the time, Captain America, The Flash, and, as well as Batman. Uh, but it was also a way that people could talk about um, their own specific cultures and uh, a way to sort of bring in uh, questions about alter egos, uh, how we were looking at the world in very interesting ways, um, and also contemporary practices. So it was also not only just the imagery, it was about the mechanics of cartoons, it was the sequential narratives, it was the iconography of using uh, explosion uh, imagery, uh, or um, uh, bendy dots, all these things that uh, were the legacies, if you will, of um, the cartoons and the pop art. You see Yoshimari Nara, the little heads in the teacups. So then I began to think, if you didn't see those diverse voices when it came to something as active as pop art, um, then where were those voices when it came to things like conceptual art practices? 
Uh, it was also looking for African American artists in places where people normally didn't look for them. Um, oftentimes, black artists sort of fell between the cracks. Uh, if you were looking at the 1970s, there was a certain perception of what was being created at that time, which was generally figurative work, uh, work that uh, lined itself with the black power movement. Uh, but there were other artists working in very, very different ways. And because um, they were neither or, uh, they somehow fell to the cracks of history. So um, double consciousness was a way of bringing those voices back, again looking intergenerationally, um, also uh, bringing works that historically had been somehow sequestered or um, um, lost, uh, bringing them back to the fore. So there was an opportunity for some older artists to recreate work, um, and also uh, artists, younger artists, who also work with heroes and heroines and pioneers within that field um, that had really uh, made an imprint and impact on their world. Adrian Piper, and this is Adrian Piper's Funk Lessons from 1985, where she would actually go out into public spheres and actually teach people how to dance uh, funk style. You know, so. David Hammonds. It's also trying to create these small portals where people can engage uh, in certain practices and in certain ways. Uh, a woman who was sort of certainly lost to this history was Sangan and Booty, uh, very active in Los Angeles during the time in the 70s, early 70s, and mid 70s. Um, here, very much like conceptual art practice, is moving between object making and performance. This is some of her objects using nylon. Um, it's from a series called RSVP from the 70s to mid 70s. Another piece from that series, Marin Hassinger, living in Baltimore and teaching. And this is actually mimicking uh, nature, but it's actually made of copper wires and steel wires. So and this was the installation at, um, at the museum itself. We had a local artist, Bert Long, who actually created uh, a piece, an installation work made of uh, ice. And so we actually had a refrigeration unit in the space. And uh, the wonderful thing about it is as people would come again and again to see the exhibition, they would notice that the temporal nature of this piece. Uh, there was this perception that because it was ice and it was in a refrigeration unit, that it would somehow maintain. But any of us who left ice cubes too long in the freezer know that ice actually evaporates. So uh, it was very interesting to see this piece shifting and changing over time as well. Renee Green, who's out in San Francisco at the San Francisco Art Institute. Another local artist, Robert Pruitt, which is a riff on the uh, Marcel Duchamp bicycle wheel. This piece is just simply called Low Rider. Uh, another local artist, David McGee, uh, in the back, who was really uh, combining concepts of Dada and the ready-made to that of hip-hop. So it was this interesting concept of looking at someone like Tristan Zara and um, really having him represented by this icon, which is very much hip-hop gear, uh, which is also this concept of paralleling making universal these questions about what do you do, what kind of artistic expression comes out of uh, spaces of decay, spaces that have been war-torn, uh, such as the urban environment uh, at the time. Nari Ward, Ellen Gallagher, uh, there were roughly 30 artists in this exhibition. Here you have the mobile staff unit, which allowed people to actually log in and uh, remotely view the installation and whoever was in the museum. So it actually played music, but it would also be a way in which uh, visitors would actually be observed uh, by those logging into the website. Uh, it had a small webcam on it that could rotate and move around. And then I was curious about 
questions of how do you present um, the mediums of light and sound? Uh, how do you represent that? And how do you represent that with artists, again, who you don't ordinarily expect to be working with in this realm? Um, Benjamin Patterson in this exhibition really began uh, my concentration on the work of Benjamin Patterson, who became later the subject of a re uh, retrospective which happened in the fall of this past year. But uh, here was a classically trained musician, very much like Cage, very much like David Tudor, in the 1960s began to look at the wealth of possibilities that music could be. So really started looking at the uh, experimental nature of music. This piece is called Duo for Voice and String Instrument, and it, it's Patterson on the double bass and William Pearson uh, with the contra um, baritone.
Uh, and so Patterson would continue on this journey of creating scores for gestures and scores for action as well as scores for music. But for this purpose, for this exhibition, uh, I wanted to present him as one of the pioneers uh, within this spectrum. Another pioneer was Tom Lloyd. Uh, and one interesting thing, uh, the Contemporary Arts Museum Houston is a very um, wonderful place. Uh, I'm originally from Houston, and to be able to grow up in an environment which fed my need and desire to see what's beyond what right in front of me was something that that institution did. So to be able to come back to Houston and to work in the very institution that really started me on the path uh, toward this, um, my own journey, uh, it's been really quite extraordinary. Uh, one of the things um, that I found in doing research for this was that the museum, which was founded in 1948, had showed Tom Lloyd's work in 1969. Uh, so this is work from 1964, 1965, and uh, in digging through all of these archives, I found that my institution had presented this work many, many years ago. Um, so it's always been on the forefront of the edge, and uh, which allows me to do some fairly um, extraordinary things there, let's just say. And these are uh, kinetic, meaning they don't just light up, they actually light up. And uh, he was an artist in residence at RCA, and so he got a lot of the early electronic equipment, uh, the sort of sequence, um, uh, remote sequencing that would allow the sort of light to uh, pulsate and move and, um, and shift. Some of the young artists in the exhibition was Cameron just working with simple mirror and light. Carolyn Harris working with mylar and light. Jenny Jones, who works with sound. Um, and now she just played two pieces. So oh, well, let's go back because I think it's important that
And these are all mechanized with uh, computer systems and uh, rain sticks, which actually shift and move very kinetic way. Uh, cinema Remixed and Reloaded, which looked at the contributions of black women to movie imaging, uh, imagery, both uh, experimental films, but also various presentations of doing uh, video and film. Howard Dina Pendel, one of the early um, uh, practitioners of using video in the early 1980s. A younger artist doing the cakewalk, and some of these were actually presented as projections, so it was really looking to at the spectrum of how uh, video was shown and presented in museums, not just simply as projections, but on, um, with on monitors, and sometimes varying the size of monitors to solicit certain types of responses from the audience. Um, this was actually projected quite large. It's Tracy Rose, a young South African artist, this piece is simply called The Whalers, uh, where um, young men dressed as Hasidic Jews were actually um, delving into swimming pools and actually playing basketball under, uh, under you know, underwater. Excuse me. So it's a really fascinating piece because it's not something you would expect to see. Uh, Bernie Searles, also out of South Africa. So we're really looking at this from a global perspective. Um, McCallum and Terry, which is a husband and wife duo. Uh, this piece was simply called Cut. And I think of all of the works in the exhibition, this one sort of resonated in the more, um, this one created a space of dialogue because what they're literally doing is shaving one another's hair with the straight edge razor. Uh, what the sound is distorted and amplified, so with every cut, it's like shh, and um, really that sense of um, um, foreboding is uh, stuck within your gut, knowing it. She said, at a point in time, it really hurt when you cut your hair with a straight edge. Uh, it's not uh, uh, the the emotions are raw and very real, and uh, this quest between a feeling of uh, both eroticism and aggression. Uh, it really played on all of the emotions that people would have seen this. Pamela Sundstrom, this piece is called Sometimes I Answer, which is animated of her literally pulling hair out of her mouth. And Carol Walker. Then I uh, started looking also at the practices of artists working contemporarily within the framework of craft and what did craft mean in a contemporary setting uh, and how to, to simply sidestep um, getting mired into this binary of whether it's craft or whether it's art, uh, really looking at really sophisticated and interesting ways that artists are working to push the dialogue further. And um, one of the, um, Glenn Adamson, who contributed to the catalog, um, is at the Albert and Victoria Museum in London. And I first approached him about um, contributing to the catalog in this exhibition. And he said, well, um, I don't know a whole lot about craft. And this is how I always begin every conversation. I don't know a whole lot about film. I don't know a whole lot about craft. Um, and so it really was going around to people and asking them about you know, what does it mean to be a craft artist today? Uh, and uh, what are the dialogues and what are the uh, conversations which are taking place? So when I presented this opportunity to Glenn, he said, well, what is the scope of the exhibition? I thought, well, I wanted to really look at the historical trajectory of artists working in craft, but presented in a fine arts context. And he said, oh, really? Okay, well, if that's what you want to do, I'll take your money, I'll write for the catalog. And I thought, oh my gosh. Uh, so I said, well, really? And he said, well, how are you progressing this conversation? How are you advancing it? If you have the resources of uh, being able to mount an exhibition, if you have the resources to actually do a publication, how are you pushing this conversation forward? You're losing an opportunity here. Uh, and really rethink it, uh, rethink it and, and call me later. And I thought, oh, the nerve of that guy, doesn't he know who I am? <laughs> uh, but you have to be humble, this is the other part of working in contemporary art. And so I did. I, I said, well, 
you're right, let me take the weekend and let me really rethink this. Because the last thing I want to do is to rehash something that someone's already done. Um, and I started looking at the artists that I was really keenly interested in. And they all had one thing in common. They all either looked to push themselves within the realm of the work that they were creating. They were either performing with it, performing in it, um, they were taking it out to the street, they were inviting audiences uh, to engage in what it is they were doing, and they thought the light bulb went off. It's like it's about this impulse to engage performance, whether the object itself is animated, uh, whether they're animating the object themselves, whether they're inviting audiences to partake of it or to interface with it, um, that performative nature is really what began to take hold and take shape. And so that then became the nature of the exhibition. So, and I really wanted to ground, as what I do with a lot of the exhibitions, to go back and ground it historically. Because it's easy for people to say, oh, it's contemporary art, that's what people are doing right now. And it's like, but everything is an extension of something else. It's my firm belief that nothing happens in a vacuum. Uh, everything is always reaching from a point, from a baseline. Uh, and uh, when you look closely, there are these links. So when you see someone like Peter Volkes, who is generally celebrated as this wonderful ceramic artist, uh, what he did often times was to uh, do these demonstrations, which actually were public performances. Uh, and they became more and more and more elaborate as he went on. The pots got bigger, the vessels became larger, and the audiences became larger. And what he was doing even then was tapping into what was happening in Europe with Bauhaus, where you had these sort of overlaps between performance, whether it was theater or dance, um, the making of work uh, in which they interfaced with, whether it was sculpture, whether it was made uh, with metal or fiber, um, there was this collapsing and uh, integration of all different types of disciplines. And so that's what I wanted to get at, uh, really looking at the spectrum of uh, wood making, uh, metal smithing, uh, glass blowing, looking at the full, all of the full um, uh, media that was presented. Early antecedents, uh, antecedents was uh, Leonore Tani, uh, this is her cloud piece uh, in which uh, a dancer performed within it. She's a very well-known fiber artist. And so linking that to one of the older artists in this exhibition, again, which was intergenerational, James Melcher, who actually studied with Peter Volkes. So you begin to see these lines. He also shared studio space with Bruce Nowley. So these ideas that uh, these artists are working in these isolated silos is really quite an you know, uh, antiquated one, that they're always out speaking to one another and engage with one another. Uh, this is a piece he did in 1972, simply called Changes, where the body itself was being used as the vessel. So um, you see here, um, he would actually dip his head uh, within the slip and then sit and allow it to dry. And there were 11 other people who participated in this. So for my exhibition, we also had video of this um, performance. We also had still photography. But he also restaged it for the first time since 1972. Uh, the B team, which was also sort of looking at how can we begin to think of glass as something you know, very performative. Um, this is a tradition that goes back to um, the Egyptians and the Greeks and the Romans. How can we contribute to the extension of how we see and understand glass and glass making? And um, they came up with um, a sort of concept of Blue Man Group meets Del Chihuly. And uh, here they have a series called Spontaneous Combustion or Stupid Glass Tricks. And here they are tap dancing on molten glass. Uh, Ryan uh, Gothard, also working in glass, who blew a series of basketballs and then went to a, um, 
a, a playground here. You can see the uh, basketball hoop and literally shot off the rubber balls alongside of the glass balls. So you really do see, um, you know, it's videotaped uh, as well. So you get that, that sense of it shattering. Uh, and what was interesting about this, speaking of hazards of contemporary art, uh, a concerned citizen uh, intervened during this performance, which was all caught on tape, so be careful how you intervene, uh, and was absolutely um, beside himself that he would be breaking glass in this playground, and became really the focal point of the piece. It's this whole concept that Art is easy to do and hard to explain sometimes, and this guy was not having it. So it really, as visceral as it was to, to hear this glass breaking on this playground, it was ever more visceral to hear this man really, in a very confrontational manner, um, tell them, you know, you call this art, I mean, really irate. Um, so it really helped shape the piece in a way that it could not have happened if he had just shot it straight. So really um, amazing piece. Um, Gabriel Craig uh, led a piece called Pro Bono Jeweler, where he literally went out into the public and just set up very guerrilla style, no certificates, no, um, no approval from the municipality, set up his jeweler bench, and literally start creating work. And uh, people would pass by and say, well, what, what are you doing? And he would engage them in conversation, and he would talk about how craft, how things that are made in this country, people don't understand how things are made in this country anymore. People just go to the store and they buy it. They don't, they, they wouldn't know it in its natural state. They don't know how jewelry is made. And so that's what I'm doing. I'm sitting here and I'm making visible this thing being made. And as that person would talk to him, he would complete, he generally made a series of um, silver rings. And he would sort of fit it, and he would give it to that person for their time. It was equally important to him that they would spend time with him the same time as it took for him to make the piece. And so, hence the, the term pro bono jeweler. Uh, Michael Ray, out of Chicago, working in wood, created this whole band set. And uh, he and several friends would book themselves into clubs throughout Chicago. And they would load, this piece is called Woodrow, and they would load the set in there very much, very serious. A lot of his friends were musicians, uh, and they would tape some of their performances, and they would literally mimic, they would lip sync and play uh, with these wooden instruments. But even down to the power chords and the plugs look very, very real. Nick Cave, uh, working in fiber, um, cre has created just uh, this amazing repository of sound suits. And in fact, there is a large scale survey of this work traveling the country simply called Meet Me at the Center of the Earth. And uh, these sound suits have grown more and more elaborate over time. Uh, Nick was trained as a dancer with the Alvin Ailey Dance Company and uh, also trained as a fiber artist at Cranbrook and at uh, the Kansas City Art Institute, and began to try to find a way to marry these two loves of movement and uh, fiber. And he began creating these sort of large-scale wearable sculptural uh, works that he would hang on mannequins. And he said one day, it was just sitting there, and I thought, well, what would this feel like if I actually put it on? He was fitting it for the mannequin based on his own body. Uh, and then he wore it, and he realized that if you made uh, a full um, suit made of buttons, that those buttons rustling against one another would create a sort of sound, uh, and so hence the name sound suit. Christy Matson, also working in fiber, uh, who would weave copper uh, along with the, the cotton uh, threads. And uh, if you touched it, which uh, visitors were encouraged to touch this piece, it would emin, uh, emit a sound based on your own electromagnetic field of your own body. Uh, so as people would touch this, it would, <laughs> would create these really interesting sounds, which, you know, um, people really, and, and that was the other thing. Oftentimes people come into a museum and the, the, the sort of uh, concept is you don't touch it. That's the first thing you learn when you're a little kid. Go in there, but don't you touch anything. Uh, it's sacred. It's not meant to be interacted with, uh, only for the site. 
and uh, to really do an exhibition where people could uh, interface with the work, that they could touch the work, not everything, but they could touch it, uh, really became, um, I saw people leaving the museum actually happy. <laughs> Uh, and it was sanctioned that they could touch it, but it was this idea that you could come to a place and uh, gather. And we had a wonderful work by Sheila Pepe, which I'll show, where we invited people to knit from this large-scale uh, fiber installation. Of course, you guys are all aware of Ann Wilson, uh, who I met uh, while working in Chicago. We were colleagues, and uh, I've remained uh, one of her biggest fans. I think she is an exceptional an extraordinary woman. Um, this piece, uh, Walking Warp, uh, is something that she cre recreated for Houston and the, uh, and the exhibition him was made. This is the exhibition itself, and you see all of the Nick Cave pieces. Uh, behind that, which you don't, it's not evident in this image, was a projection of these sound suits actually being, Nick actually dancing inside of the sound suits. Um, so you were able to actually see this movement happening. Uh, this is the Sheila Pepe piece. Uh, and uh, we actually looked at schools out and we bought uh, uh, crochet needles as well as knitting needles. And we had a series called um, Cocktails and Crochet. Uh, and people would come after work and literally sit very much. And we even had a group called Bitch and Stitch. Uh, who came, and they would sit for hours uh, just talking and knitting and drinking, uh, and so it really became a gathering place in a very organic way. And I think people were really sad that they couldn't drink and knit in the museum anymore after the show left. Again, a close-up of the Nick Cave, and you can see the evolution of these sound suits, how they really did shift. They started as these sort of A-frame pieces, and then they became more elaborate with the headdresses. The wood load here, you see, and then uh, the videos uh, of both Michael Ray and Gabriel Craig's pro bono jeweler. And uh, this piece is by a woman from Baton Rouge, uh, Cynthia Giachetti, who uh, actually created a lot of these. These are all uh, fire uh, porcelain. And uh, she recovered the chandelier from Katrina. She actually lived in New Orleans uh, during that time. and. Um, really would take this detritus from uh, this storm uh, and this, this catastrophic event and try to beautify it in some way. So at the very end of the exhibition, these pieces were actually given away to the public. Uh, and if you go on to, um, if you go to uh, YouTube and just put in Hand Plus Me, we actually videotaped all of the performances from Cynthia Giachetti to the uh, crochet cocktail events to the James Melcher changes. Um, and we presented that onto our website so that people could, if they weren't there, uh, could actually uh, see. But this was very reverent because she read this statement about the necessity to pass uh, something back, give something back. Uh, and that as people would take these, they would take um, these elements with the responsibility that they are to give back. Uh, and so people were very reverent. They lined up, uh, and when uh, she would give it to them, they literally would do their hands like this. So it, it really was quite uh, a moving moment. Um, this is Ann Wilson's Walking the Wharf. We actually collaborated with several arts organizations throughout the city on this project. Uh, in this case, it was with Hopestone Dance Company. Um, we did the event um, as a public event over three days, uh, spread out over the course of the exhibition, and people were invited to sit and watch the dancers walk the walk with Ann. And of course, you might remember all of this uh, uh, fiber, which was donated from the Knoxville Museum of Art after Ann's um, um, project here. And this is the finished piece. So last but not least uh, was this uh, retrospective of Benjamin Patterson, um, Fluxus artist who was engaged in this practice from the very beginning, but had, for whatever reasons, been lost to history. Uh, so this was uh, an amazing opportunity, uh, which took six years of research, 
um, to actually bring this to the fore. Uh, it happened at the Contemporary Arts Museum in November of 2010, and it's currently traveling. It's at the Studio Museum in Harlem uh, currently. So I've already introduced him, so I'll just show you quickly uh, some of the early performance documentation. Uh, again, he's well known for the scores that he's created, but he's also a fantastic object maker, and that was something that people were simply not aware of. This is De Collage for Wolf Estelle from 1962. This is a 1964 piece called uh, Lit Piece, and uh, it's from a self-published book of scores called Methods and Processes, uh, in which it simply reads, um, cover shapely female with whipped cream lick. Top off toppings of nuts and cherries is optional. Um, some of the objects uh, that were really presented for the first time because Patterson left New York in the late 80s and uh, relocated to Wiesbaden where he now lives in Germany. Uh, a lot of the objects have never really been seen in the United States. So this piece is called Helmet, it's from the 70s. Uh, some of the early books that he created from the 1960s. Uh, fishing lures, he did two complete packets uh, of fishing lures. One was called Trout Bag, uh, another was called Hook, where he would manipulate these fishing uh, lures. This piece is called Dark Vader. Hell on Wheels from 1984. Marble Hat. Uh, this is a performance he did, uh, which was actually a restaging of a Nam June Pike piece called One for Violin. So Patterson restaged this piece and then created the piece Two for Violin after Nam June Pike's One for Violin, which was literally picking up the shards of this violin which had been violently slammed on someone's head and creating a sort of sculpture from it. And that's it. So <laughs> uh, upcoming is work by Donald Moffat. Um, it's an exhibition I'm currently working on that opens in October of this year. So if you find yourself in Houston, please come and visit. So thank you for your patience. Thank you for being here. Yes, sir. How possible differentiation between presenting and 
Yes. Yeah. 